All right, so going into lab, one of the first terms that we need to address is the anatomical position. The anatomical position is this for reference that we should all hold on to in our heads when we are thinking about the human body. And this is the anatomical position that you're seeing here. Typically, it's described as standing face forward, just as our model in the image is doing so. Face, palms, and feet are forward. We can see face, palms, and feet forward, and the thumbs are going straight to the side. Everything's pretty easy, right? But the hand position might be the only one you might forget. Make sure that you know that whenever we are talking about the human body, we are talking about, or we are thinking about, or holding on to this reference, the anatomical position. The longitudinal midline axis, this is going to be a term to describe this imaginary line that you see that cuts a human into two equal segments. You'll see that we exhibit symmetry on both sides on the surface. Technically, on the inside, we are not the same on this side and on this side, but we are, for the most part, on the surface, we exhibit something referred to as bilateral symmetry. Bi means, what does typically bi imply? What happened? Two, exactly. And then lateral is going to be going, it's going to be meaning Latin to go, going to the sides. This is going to be important later, so let's just log it away today, right now going to the sides, meaning that if we're looking at our model, lateral means going to the side of the body, to the side of the body, lateral. If you're going from your nose and I told you, tell you, go lateral, where, what structure are we going to end up at at the very end? The ear, lateral. And so the opposite of this would be medial, medial, going towards that axis, medial. And so with that in mind, this longitudinal axis will be important because we separate a lot of terminology or organize our strategies in studying the human body on this axis. And very simply, it just means that everything that is on this line. Anything that isn't on this line would be something like these limbs. The limbs are considered not part of this axis because really they, you know, they discontinue. So you, we're going to refer to this axis a little bit later down the line a little uh, today. And so with that... Let's move on. Let's move on. And so as we look internally now, as we look internally, you'll notice that there are cavities inside of the human body. We are not just this bowl of swimming organs where organs are, you know, as we're running around, the stomach isn't bouncing around and intertwining with your small intestines. Your liver doesn't go to the other side. It stays on one side. There's an organization to the inside of the body. And that's what this whole segment is. This image corresponds to this table. So some new vocab words we have to learn are dorsal, which is going to mean the back of the body, back of body. And the opposite, the ventral, will refer to the front of the body. Dorsal, back of the body, front of the body. And if you have trouble remembering, forgetting this, is that try to remember that if you are thinking about water, right? Like let's say that you're in the ocean, right? And what's the most dangerous thing you would imagine seeing, like, right next to you? Right? What is that supposed to be? A shark fin. This fin is referred to as a dorsal fin. A dorsal fin. It's on the back. So if you imagine a person now, like right now that I'm standing here in the middle of your screen, if you notice your hand, if you keep this V shape in the very front of your body, it makes a V for ventral, which makes it easier to remember this one, ventral. And then if you go backwards, it makes a dorsal fin. You see that dorsal fin that I just made? So dorsal fin, ventral. So the, everything that is in the front of the body is referred to as ventral. Everything you see at the back is considered dorsal. And it's not just a position, right? Like when I say it's on the ventral side, you get what I mean. It's on the front of my body. If I say it's on the dorsal side, you get it's on the back of my body. But if I said I'm starting off this position and I say move ventral, where's my finger going to go towards? That way or that way? A or B? A. Ventral means it's also telling someone where to go. 
So ventral is this way, dorsal would be this way. You also learn two more right now. What is going to the side called one more time? Lateral. So going lateral, where's my finger going to go right now? To the sides. I can do either direction, right? If I say lateral left, that's this side for me. Lateral left, this way. If I say lateral right, this way. If I say lateral, you don't know. It just means going to the side. Going to the side. What's the opposite of going to the lateral? Medial. Going medial. And so you can see that it's not only a side of the body. This is the lateral side of my body. Like right now, you're all seeing ventral. Now, you're seeing lateral. Now, you're seeing the back or dorsal. And what are you seeing on this side? Lateral. Also lateral. But you're seeing lateral left, lateral right. That's the only difference there. And so this table becomes very easy to sort of begin to interpret when we look at this first portion referred to as the dorsal body cavity. This dorsal body cavity sits on the back of the body, housing two independent cavities. So this, these two little cavities are within these, this category of cavities. So one last time, I'm going to phrase it more in a more human way. This is the back of the, the cavities on the back of the body. You have one on top, one at the bottom, and they are technically connected together, but they are considered separate cavities. But both of them together comprise or make up the dorsal body cavities. One thing to know is the, an, an example organ that is in each cavity. So we all know what's going to be stored up here in the skull. What's the organ we're going to learn? The brain. Nice and easy. The vertebral cavity, the vertebra. Vertebra. If this EL wasn't here and I put like an E here, that would be the word vertebra. And that refers to the bone that makes up the entire protective encasement of the spinal cord. What runs in this yellow line on my screen, does yours print in color? Do they print in color for me here? No. This yellow portion here on my screen is where the spinal cord runs. Typically non and, it, and you know, anatomy students or students who never uh, been exposed to this always confuse spinal cord and vertebra for the same word. Vertebra refers to the bone that you're seeing on the screen, and spinal cord refers to the cables that are coming down from the brain, and that's going to be inside this cavity called the vertebral cavity, and it contains the organ, the spinal cord. Next, as we progress, and you can see on our color scheme, you can see we have ventral body cavities. That means cavities that are located on the anterior or part in the front of the body. And so there are three cavities we care about. There are dorsal cavity, there is the abdominal cavity, and then there is the pelvic cavity. And so the thoracic cavity is called after the fact that the thoracic cavity, this space on the inside, is completely surrounded by the thoracic cage. If you look at my assistant up here on the front of the classroom, you'll see that he has this rib cage in front of him. And inside of here, we should all kind of know what two organs are here on both sides for breathing. And then what's the one in the center that beats? Heart. Heart. And so this thoracic cage, thoracic cage made of the thoracic vertebra and the ribs, the thoracic cage is what inside of this is where we have the thoracic cavity. Be very careful with that. The bones is the thoracic cage, but the space and the container of the lungs and the heart, all of it together inside of that space is considered the thoracic cavity. And so you already know your two example organs, heart and lungs, nice and easy. And you might have all heard of a muscle. This muscle here in the very center here, this is referred to as the diaphragm. This is a muscle. And, and it just so happens to also make a perfect boundary. And let me reposition my iPad here so I can write a little bit better. Also happens to be the border between thoracic and abdominal. And it is a muscle that helps with breathing, by the way. Well, you'll need this later, today, and for the first exam. You just need to be able to identify it. But otherwise, diaphragm and involved in breathing for the future. 
And so once we go down from the top here, from the thoracic, and we go down to this abdominal cavity, abdominal cavity is pretty easy to learn. It's like the named after what we commonly use, the abdominal region, the abs that we normally commonly call it. And it contains the digestive viscera. Don't let this word intimidate you. This is a Latin word to imply something internal. Even sometimes intimate. I know it sounds weird, but one day you'll encounter it in an English class or something. Like someone will say, oh, I had such a visceral dream. It sort of means that it's something so close to home, so intimate. Something that's just like something you would understand. So that's why intimate is the best word, I think, to use there. But otherwise, in the case of anatomy, we meant, mean to imply like sort of an expression. It's sort of like saying inners in a way. You've always heard that say like, oh, you got to take out the inners of that animal you just hunted to, you know, to gut it, right? But otherwise, the inners. And so viscera is a good example. You don't need to give me, or you can if you want to use a specific example, but you should know what's an example of something involved in digestion. What's the most famous one with stomach acid, with acid in it? The stomach. The stomach. What's the one that the long um, tube-like network? The intestines, right? Some form of the intestines, whether it's small or large. And so they are all examples of digestive viscera. If I asked for one on the exam, give me whatever you feel comfortable with. You can either write digestive viscera or you can write stomach or intestines as your example. And then after that, following this abdominal cavity, we have our pelvic cavity, which is going to contain our bladder, our reproductive organs, and our rectum. And that's going to be in that pelvic cavity. And moving forward, this table is handy because it sums up that image, but it's more in a, ver in a verbal manner. And so you can, uh, sorry, in a more uh, table manner, tab tabular manner. And so when you look at this, you'll see that it's everything we discussed. And I'm just going to add a little bit more to it now. We pretty much should know all these cavities and where they're located and their examples. And you'll notice that there's just some last things to clarify on. And so starting with our thoracic cavity. When we look at our thoracic cavity, this is that diaphragm I was referring to, that muscular boundary. And if you look at this region, you'll see that you have both lungs on both sides. And the cavity that surrounds the lung is called a pleural cavity. And even though it's not well, well shown on this image here, when you look at this image, you look at my illustration, I'm going to draw it in myself, here in green, I'm going to dash it in, there would be an encasement, a cavity, something covering the lung entirely, protecting it. And what it looks like is that it looks like something just like this, like what you're looking at here. I know that it says other stuff, but it looks just like this, a double wall membrane. And you know what? For the sake of the recording, I'm going to go ahead and just look for an image of it because I know I do have one. And it'll take me a second to get. And so let's go here, 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 and And I lied, I cannot find it. So I'm going to have to use this example one here. And so when we look at this image here, what you have to imagine, this is a schematic, right? Like there's nothing in your body that's a fist and a, a balloon-like structure like this. But you're the cavities that I'm referring to, in other words, this plural cavity, if you were to actually zoom in on these dashed lines, what you would, enc would encounter is this very structure. You would encounter a double-layered wall. I'm going to write the numbers on here. Layer 1, layer and together they create that cavity if you look at the inside that i'm highlighting right now this region inside is a cavity that's what the cavity is when we refer to as a pleural cavity and so let's give it a more proper definition we're going to call it a double walled Membrane. And again, the word membrane, I'm just going to put boundaries. It just means boundaries. Dang it, I ran out of space. One second. Dang it. Boundaries. Yes. 
And so it happens to look like this. And the purpose of this cavity is to contain serous fluid. I'm going to add that to our little notes here. Contains serous fluid. Serous fluid. That's a word you might not have heard yet. And this will be more relevant for lecture, so you might as well just get it now. And fundamentally, what this is for is that it's a cushion. Like, you have to imagine to yourself, like, what the texture would be. You can imagine to yourself what the texture is if you imagine to yourself a Ziploc bag. That if you were to grab a Ziploc bag fresh out of the box, and then you were to just, you know, you sort of undo it so that it, like, widens out and you can spread it open. Now, if you were to open it and you were to put soap in there, right, just liquid hand soap, and then you close it, you can all imagine what it would feel like, right? Sort of like an easy, cushiony, lubricant, it's like very, like just a cushion in general. And that's what this, ca what, what this cavity is, is that you have to imagine to yourself or know that your lungs are always in this expansion and then also the, this contraction, meaning that it goes smaller again. And so this cavity helps protect it against the rib cage because remember, it's located within the rib cage and so, it has to be well lubricated so to prevent a, any damage of, on the lung. And so with that, you can see that the next cavity that we're going to learn about is called the pericardial cavity. And the good news is, is that it's the same exact thing. It is made, it is made of the, the same structures, two walls just like this. And so to expand a little bit on it, and now with a good picture, is that you can see here that here's the heart. And then you can see it has its double-walled cavity here. The lung has the same exact setup. If, you, if I could, I would draw a lung here, and it would replace that heart, and the cavity would look almost exactly the same. It's just the cavity that surrounds the entire heart or the entire lung. It just depends. So now let's clarify and move on. The pleural cavity, that's the name of the cavity, around the lungs. It has two walls, just like the cavity around the heart. The one around the heart is called pericardial cavity. And the good news is, is that you kind of already know this. What does cardio imply? Heart. So cardi is going to always imply heart. And what is perimeter the measurement of? Right, what does peripheral mean? It means outside, right? Peripheral vision, if you're not sure what that means. Like right now, I'm looking straight ahead, but all of you that are looking at me, it may seem like I'm looking right here, but really I'm looking at that table right here with all the students there. Peripheral vision on the sides. Perimeter, the perimeter of the screen is the edges. Peri, peri is Latin to mean around. You must know this now. Peri means around in Latin. In this class, you are learning another language. So peri in Latin means around. So the word itself is telling you what it does or where it's located. It literally means around heart cavity, pericardial cavity. Last thing to add, there are names to the walls, names to the outside walls. In other words, wall one and wall two that I sort of denote, uh, annotated here. This first wall is called visceral. What did viscera mean? Inside. And so you can see if you compare wall number one and wall number two, the one that's on the inside or the one closest to the organ is going to be wall number one. And so we're going to give it the label number one. Visceral pericardium is the wall closest to the organ. And see, if you just need the word viscera, the way we learn digestive viscera, visceral, that word itself means inside. And so that wall is the inside wall. And so pericardium is just added to the word to imply pericardial cavity, pericardium. So this means inside pericardial cavity wall altogether. But you just have to call it visceral pericardium. Next, number two, is going to be called parietal. Some of you might have heard the word parietal before. When you look at this skull model I have on my, the back of my, uh, sorry, on this model, when you look at this here, you'll see this bone is called the parietal bone, and it's the most outer bone of the skull. And so parietal in Latin means outer. 
And so that's why the brain lobe is called parietal lobe. The skull bone is called parietal bone because in Latin, parietal means outer. And so that's called the parietal pericardium for that reason. And so there's only one last thing to add, but now it's going to be sort of a common sense question. What if I asked you, what is the name of the cavity? What is the name of wall number one of the lung called altogether? Very good. Visceral. And then are we going to call it pericardium though? Probably not. What word are we sort of going to be play, play, playing with? Plural cavity. So viscera, and it's just nice and easy, plura. Plura. Some of you answered visceral plural cavity, and that was just a perfect, that was a good answer too that I would accept. But you can simplify it and call it visceral plura. And vice versa, what's the opposite wall called? Parietal what? Plura. Nice and easy. Right, versus par. I'm gonna write. Uh, I put X there. Let me put versus. It makes it a little bit easier. There we go. Versus parietal par. And you'll notice that there is. Let's go back to this table here, just so we can see. We've gone through the cranial cavity that houses the cranial cavity that houses brain, vertebral column that houses the spinal cord, thoracic, which has a pleural cavity on the right lung and also on the left lung. That should make sense to us. You have two lungs, so each one has a cavity, so they both have their own cavities. Next, mediastinum is gonna be this cavity that you find where, where we find our pericardial cavity, the one that surrounds the heart. But you'll notice that there's this one little segment here, superior, posterior, and that's because there are structures on the heart, such as these major vessels, that need a little bit of a space for them. And so this outline that I have here in blue is referred to as your mediastinum, and it includes the pericardial cavity within there. This is the same pericardial cavity that has the two visceral and the parietal pericardium walls. And you can sort of even see them when you zoom in, that the first wall here, number one, would be on that side, number two would be on that side. It's technically this one, number one, that wall, that line, and then number two is that line. And then the inside has that fluid called serous fluid. That's the only reason these cavities exist around the heart and the lungs. Because again, they contain serous fluid. This will really matter in lecture. That's why it's kind of a kind of stress it in here. But here you just need to be able to identify these things. And so with that, as we move on to finish up our cavities, you'll see that we have our abdominal cavity that again is going to be boundary or the first border is going to be the diaphragm. And then the inferior border of the abdominal cavity is going to be the pelvic cavity. And the word inferior that I just used means below, below, inferior. We'll learn this next. Inferior, pretty easy, right? Inferior means below. And so there will be a little practice, uh, like a little group assignment that you're all going to be, the worksheet at the end of this uh, packet, and you'll have to sort of use sort of like a critical thinking for this, and we'll go through it together once we all try it out. But otherwise, this, this is why this image is here, and you'll see it in a second. Why? So moving forward, and I'm actually going to go ahead and skip this two sections. We're going to come back to it. It is very simple, but I'm going to go ahead and jump to this page here. And we will come back to the other page. And so on your list, right, the reason that we're sort of skipping is that you'll notice that we are seeing a few, we're, we already, oh, sorry, pardon, pardon, we, we are gotten over our body cavities, that's what we've gone over just now, and next what we're going to go over is our regional anatomy, and even though we're going a little out of order, there is sort of, um, we're going starting from larger to small in a way, we're like a, more from outside, but... <laughs> advanced concept, concepts, big picture concepts to smaller concepts, because I find it a little bit easier to actually learn all this stuff 
or uh, to learn it in that direction. So it's worked out for the last few years. And so now we're going to move on to this one. All right, and then we're going to go in this order if you're following along with this list. And so with that, dang it, dang it, sorry, dang it. All right. And so this is a cool coloring assignment or labeling assignment that you can use. But otherwise, for today, your goal is to understand how to interpret and read and maybe some study techniques for this and the purpose of this. A lot of us may have studied anatomy before or have heard this because we've all have, have had friends or had injuries. What's the name of the huge bone called here? The femur bone, if some of you have never heard it. That's the femur bone. Femur spelled like this. Femur. But that's the name of the bone. What do you call the area? Like, let's just say I want to refer to this general area, the skin on top. You wouldn't use the word femur because it doesn't make sense. But what we're learning right now is essentially regional surface terms. And I like to sort of shorthand it, like as far as thinking goes, is that it's like geography of the human body. It's like looking at a map, and then you're looking at states, right? Like if you look at the map of the U.S., right, you have the states, the borders of a state, and then you have Vegas next door, Washington on top. You know, they're just essentially boundaries. And so that's the goal of this portion is to understand that there are regions of the body that you have normally called something else your whole life. Like, for example, this is the nose. But today, you're going to have to sound more anatomy, fancy, like, what's the word, fancy pants? You're going to have to call it nasal, right? Nasal is the medical term. We're all familiar with that one. That one's pretty easy. But what do we call this region here normally in our day-to-day -day speak? Our forehead. But in anatomy, forehead does not exist. Now it's called frontal. Frontal. And so that's what or how to use this table, is that you'll notice that there will be a number, and there'll be a descriptive word of things that you know, forehead, for example, head, but that might not be as clear. So if you look at this number, one, right, will correspond to easily number one. Nice and easy. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm just trying to show you how it works so that, that way you can study it and without labels because that's the goal is that you should be able to identify these structures on a person and on diagrams uh, and on the models that if I point to the nasal or the frontal region on the models, even on your tables right now, you would be able to answer it because remember, your tests are on your table right now. Those are your test questions and where you're going to be looking for these terms on those models on your table. So with that, let's go through these terms. There is another key, if you flip to the next page, that I'm going to be using to sort of talk about these terms. And because it's not very hard, right, rocket science, it's going to be memorization, but sometimes hearing some, a story or a, around it is a little bit easier to remember, and also there is one thing to keep an eye on. Let's just uh, start talking about it now. So with that, cephalon or cephalic, you'll notice that there are two words. They are both acceptable as far as when anatomy goes. But for our purposes, you're going to refer to just the one in parentheses. That's the word you want. That's also the word that you're going to encounter in your tables. And that's the one I want you to care about, the regional term that is within these tables or here in parentheses. Let's write that in. Only what's in parentheses. And something to keep an eye on in your anatomy journey is to, when you're interpreting these diagrams, is that you always want to start from larger to smaller. You'll note that here there's a bracket, and then there's two mini brackets, right? Uh, down here you'll see that there is one inclusive bracket, or including all these structures, that includes all these structures. The trunk is a structure that includes all these structures. So you just want to be mindful of these brackets. You'll see it again in the hand, that the whole hand is going to be called manual. But there's going to be little parts to the hand, such as the palm, right, which is easily called palmer and pollux. And so let's go down and break these down. And so first thing, 
Cephalic is going to refer to the entire head, the entire head on the exam and on the models. If I put a wrap or a tape around the entire or some sort of thing that circles around the whole head, I am looking for the word cephalic. If I only ask you for cranial, then I'll probably only ask you right above here where you're seeing this bracket. I'll find a way to label only the area above. And if I only want facial, then I would only be highlighting or bracketing all of these structures in blue that you're seeing. But you want to be careful because if I just put a little arrow, like I put a little piece of tape, and all I do is put a little arrow, let me draw it in to show you an example. All I really do is I grab a piece of tape with an arrow and I point to, say, right there. And what would you be answering if it's right there where that arrow is? Nasal, nice and easy. But if I got, grab a piece of tape and then I put the piece of tape like this, what are you answering instead? Facial, nice and easy, right? So with that, if we examine just the cranial region, the cranial region is going to have the frontal region, which is going to be that segment that we normally call our forehead. And the good news is that you learn this, you're also learning your skeleton. The name that you're going to have to learn for the skeleton exam, the first bone you encounter is called the frontal bone. Very easy. Nasal, nose, no explanation there. You might understand now why oculus, that, that virtual reality gaming thingy, is called the oculus is because it's named after oculus, the fact that that's actually in a reference to the eyes. And so ocular is the appropriate term, and orbital, they are both acceptable. Use the one that you like best. Otic is going to refer to the ear. There are other instances where instead of otic, other textbooks, other campuses use auricle. It means the same, that you can use both for our exam if you like, whichever one you like. The cheek is going to be called buccal. The muscle involved, even around our cheek, that helps us compress our cheek so that we can withdraw liquid out of a straw is called buccinator. So buccal will help you remember that very fact, buccal. Oral, you're all no strangers to this one. If you brush your teeth, you'll see that it's called an oral hygienic product, some form in some category of that. Mental might be a little hard because, you know, you might think this is like something to do with your brain. But mental actually refers to your chin. So be careful with that. Now, with that, cervical is going to refer to your neck. There are bones in this region called the cervical bones. And that's why this is called cervical. As we make our way down the body, down the neck, you'll see that we encounter the trunk of the body. The trunk is this entire region where the limbs attach to, even the bottom ones, right? So the trunk does not include the limbs. It is the region that attaches the limbs, all right? So it's everything within the highlighted space that you're seeing right now of our model on the screen. That's the trunk. And within that trunk, we have here our thoracic, right? This one's pretty easy. We know that this whole region is going to be where our rib cage is, actually right here. And with this one, we should draw in. Let's draw it in. And if you're not sure on that model, it should look relatively like this. Like this. Number 10, thoracic. That's the boundary. And I might have done it too high here. Eh, I could afford to go a little higher up. And it arcs, too, so it shouldn't be like this. Technically, it should be drawn like this. There we go. And so that's our thoracic region. But remember, within that thoracic region, inside of it, there's a cavity. What's the cavity called? Thoracic cavity. What's the bones called? Around the thoracic cavity? It's called a thoracic cage. Good. And so the outside, again, thoracic region, the bones, thoracic cage, and let's write that actually. Let's write that up here. Yikes. Alright. 
So there is a difference between thoracic region, thoracic cavity, thoracic cage. The thir thoracic region is the surface you encounter. Technically, yeah, the surface you encounter, the region up top. Thoracic cavity is the cavities housing the organs. Dang it. Housing. Oh, it's because it's wobbling. There we go. Sorry, one second. Housing, lungs, plus heart. And thoracic cage is the bones surrounding. These are R's. I've been told my R's are terrible, so I'm just getting ahead of it now. Surrounding. The cavities. Okay. All right. And so with that, our abdominal region, we're no strangers to that. We know there's a cavity called the abdominal region. So the outside portion is going to be called the abdominal region. And then our belly button is called the umbilical region because that is where the umbilical is when we are infants in our, or fetuses in our mother's wombs. And then we have the pelvic region, which is going to be where the, we find that pelvic cavity on the inside of the body. As we progress more down or inferior, we are going to encounter two structures. One's going to be called inguinal. It's going to be important in a second. And it's spelled like this, inguinal. And so inguinal are going to refer to those regions that you see those lines and where you actually encounter the genitalia. This is typically going to be the pubic region, the pubic region. And so that makes up the entire thoracic and abdominal and pelvic regions, all of these together. And now, but one thing that we have to do now for the head and for the trunk is that we got to look at the posterior or the dorsal side of the body. And so if we look at our model in anatomical position, you'll see that some things might change. There's a word back here not on your handout. Let's draw it in. This is going to be called your occipital. And let me do it in red here so we can see. Occipital. It is on your table, but not on this diagram. Just wanted to clarify. Occipital. You'll notice that the shoulder, the very shoulder here where the arm tends to begin, is called a chromial, and it also goes by a term called deltoid. You can use both. Either one is okay. Deltoid or a chromial for shoulder, whichever one you like. That's going to be, again, the shoulder region. Now, as we progress downward from the cervical region, this region that you encounter on the back of the body, the entire region, is just called dorsal, like the back of the body. Right, dorsal, nice and easy. And now where you have a curvature, you know when they say you should buy a, a chair with really good what support? Lumbar. Lumbar support. They're talking about this region. So it should have a good curvature there to support lumbar. As we get down to the pelvic region, you'll see the two that we always sort of hear the word glutes, right? Gluteal refers to the region. Gluteus would be wrong in a way because, well, actually, sorry, if you say like gluteus maximus, gluteus, the muscles that are there, it's wrong because the, when they I say, or the question asks for ID region, you are answering gluteal. If they were to ask ID the muscle, you would be answering gluteus maximus. I think we've all heard of that muscle before. But otherwise, all we're covering for the first exam is just knowing gluteal. There is a space underneath here, in between the anus and the genitalia, called the perineal space, spelled like this. I added it to right here, perineal. And on your diagram, you can see that it is located. We have it highlighted here as number 39. That's the space between the genitalia. Just keep that in mind. And it's there on the list for you for the future. And number 39.
and with that the limbs are even easier to address and so if we start at the very top portion of the limb don't forget that the shoulder tends to be called deltoid or acromial if you progress down the armpit is no longer called an armpit in anatomy we call it the axillary region axillary and you know the good news is that if you learn all of this you're also going to be learning a lot of your arteries and veins because guess what the nerve that runs through here is going to be called the axillary nerve what do you think the artery that runs there is going to be called the axillary artery what do we think the veins there that runs there is going to be called the axillary vein and so that's the good thing about learning regions next we have brachial Brachial region is going to refer to this region where you have the famous bicep muscle. The portion that folds, what you've always called the elbow, has an anterior or a, door, a ventral side, a side on the front, and a side on the back. The side on the front is called anticubital. The side on the back, right, if I flip it over to the dorsal side, the back of it is called all the cranial so be very cautious of that that is one of those things that can be sort of a trick question that if you are not careful if there's an arrow here you might answer anticubital because you learned anticubital in the front but if they ask it in the front anticubital if they ask it in the back you are answering all cranial say that word with me all cranial good that's a tough one to pronounce all the cranial. And then the next one we have is antibrachial. Antibrachial is going to be this region that's after that brachial, in the front of the brachial region. That's kind of the way they think about it. I don't like saying it that way, but that's the way you can think about it. First antibrachial, then brachial. Now, what does the word carpal tunnel refer to? Yeah, your wrist. Carp like some sort of ailment in your joints on your wrist, and now you know why. Carpal tunnel, right? Carpal refers to your wrist. Carpal, the part that folds. And then as you progress, you'll see your palm, simply called palmer. Your pollux is the only special digit you have. It is considered the thumb, pollux, and the rest of them go by either digital or phalanges or phalangeal. You can use whichever one sticks best. I do not care. Pick one of those. You only need to write one on your exam. And one last thing to be cautious for, be, if I grab a piece of tape and I circle the whole hand, you are instead answering manual. But if I point to little individual portions with a little arrow, you are answering digital in this case, right, in this example. If I point here, digital. If I point here, pollux. If I point here, palmar. So be very cautious of this type of annotation during the exam. the whole thing and the good news is if you know one arm you know the other one the only thing to be cautious for don't forget about that elbow that elbow comes with the very trick question a tr easy trick question easy trick question next leg when we get to the leg the leg is going to start off with the femoral region femoral then just like the elbow, you're going to have an easy region for a trick question. You have a region in the front, which is kind of easy. We all know it as the kneecap. Some of us might have learned that we have a knee bone called the patella there. And so it's simply called patellar region. And if you flip it to the other side, to the dorsal side, you would see it's called popliteal instead, which can be a little tough, right? Popliteal. And the artery that runs back here, what do we think it's going to be called? the popliteal artery. What do we think the vein that runs there is going to be called? Popliteal vein. So you're learning a lot right now, believe it or not. Popliteal. But keep in mind, the front or the ventral side of the leg, the ventral side, the front side, is going to be called the patella. Next. Next tricky region. We have computer science. I always think computer science, think of this word, crew roll, and in the back where the calf muscle is, Sural. I always remember just CS, like computer science, to remind me that computer or C is in the front, S in the back, just to remember the order. I don't know if it's always helped me. I don't know if it'll help you. But computer science, C for the front, 
S for the back. As we progress more inferior or down, is we next encounter the wrist of our leg, so to speak. That this is going to be our ankle. This is going to be called the tarsal region. The big toe, just like the thumb, sorry. The big toe, just like the thumb, has a special name called the hallux. And the rest of them are going to be called digital or phalangeal, just like above. They have the same name. But the hallux is going to be unique to the big toe. The whole foot is going to be called pedal. Next, as you look at the back of the foot, the part that elevates when you go when you do go on your tippy toes is going to be called your calcaneal. And the bone that's here is called calcaneus and neus, the bone. And so it'll be helpful to log this word away because it'll help you remember that bone. You're going to have to learn it later. And yes, this is E-U-S, calcaneus, calcaneus. And then the bottom of the foot is going to be called plantar. And just keep in mind, upper limb, lower limb, pretty easy. And all right, so make sure you owe me all the terms on that first page that have to do with these terms. So your homework is to get this and log these terms in your head. I will have an extra credit opportunity next week on Monday, and so you want to make sure that this is the first bit of memorization that this class demands, and it's where we start for anatomy. And it's pretty fun and easy, too. Some study tips is be able to go back and forward either on a diagram, on the mirror, on a, on a person in front of you, like when you're eating dinner with your families or you, when you're eating with your friends. If they have tattoos or as you're walking around doing your groceries, look at where someone has a tattoo, and then tell yourself what region is it. So, like, if we're thinking about... What was the back of that elbow? They have a tattoo covering the back of that elbow. What's that word I made you say with me? Oh, oh the crane, all right. So you just can keep practicing that in the mirror. Keep in mind that not all of them have a unique name, right? This is all the crane off. The front was antipubital. And so up here is brachial, 14. So you see the same designation, 14. So just keep that in mind that the numbers are dedicated to each term. And you should be able to find each one of these in your list. There are. In that first list, some trick uh, terms in there. They're not trick terms. They're there to, that because I kind of want you to Google things. Like, for example, you're going to see some words like radial, sacral, scapular, and sternal. These are something that I'm not going to include in the extra credit, but there's something, the tibial and ulnar. These are things I want you to sort of, as you go through the list, I want you to make sure that you all go through every single one of them, and then you look at that table, you look at that Im those images, and you can find it on your body and on a model, on a picture, and there will be some that you will not know or are not on that table. They're sort of meant for you to sort of just get a head start. Like scapular, what is it named after? What bone probably? Scapula. Scapula, nice and easy, right? So if you were to look it up, you would see this, these, these bones would come up on your Google search, and there'll be a reason for it and a fun little thing to do at the very end, which we're going to try out right now, actually, in a second. And so. So we need, we need all the, uh, the regions by Monday? Monday for extra credit for your exam. You need to know it by the 19th, whenever your exam was. I think I saw it said 19 on there. 19th. And yes. And so with that, Nice. And that was the hardest thing that we, you had to do if you're with me so far. The next is going to be very, very easy. And we're going to apply our new terms together as a team. And then I'll let you go today. So we're going to have to step back now, back to where we were on this part of the packet. Now, these two tables that you're seeing are a summary of the following page. You'll see, but what I want you to sort of know is that there are nine regions. And up here, you'll see the word quadrants is the theme. Quadrant, 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 quadrant. And so all of this naming system is called quadrants, just like math. For example, we're not going to do math. I just mean like, you know, x and y axis. So if you look at this side here, 
we know that the entire portion here, I'm not that tall, let me use my pointer. When you look at this portion, this entire portion is the trunk, right? We saw that. We saw that the belly button was called the umbilical region. So the, the ab abdomen, however, is so large and you have so many different organs, the digestive viscera in this space, that it becomes important to be able to specify exactly what you want to work on. And so the abdominal region, in other words, this region that we analyzed, number 16 here, 16, again, is going to be your abdominal region. And so that abdominal region, can, you can see it can be divided into regions or quadrants. That's it. That's all this means. And so if you look at the regions, let's start off here in the center, ab umbilical region, where the belly button is. Now, we got to learn some Latin. Epi in Latin means upon. And what does the word gastric sort of remind us of? Yeah, like, kind of like the stomach, right? Kind of like digestive organs. So if you combine those two words together, it's like saying above digestive organs, above digestion, in a way, right? In above digestive. And that makes it so easy to remember the next term because what do, we, what do we call low blood sugar? Hypoglycemic. What do we call when you're kind of suffering from low, excessive low body temperature? Hypothermia. So the key word there is hypo. What do we think hypo means there for? Below. Right, so you can see that the words themselves sort of tell you exactly what they are once you log away the word epi and hypo. Epi, gastric, means above. Hypo means below. Nice and easy. When we look at this next segment, something that we're going to log away today because it will matter in a week, uh, next week, is this word chondri. In Latin, this word means cartilage. This I expect none of you to know yet. If you do, awesome. But if you don't, cartilage. In Latin, chondri, as you're seeing here, chondri means cartilage. And hypo, therefore, together, what does this word probably mean, together? Below, Below the cartilage is now. What the heck are they talking about? And if you look at my assistant here, and you look at the rib cage, right? If you look at the screen right now first, you look, I want you to look at this part of the rib cage of the model that I drag here to the front of the screen. And you'll note that you have this little texture here, the skeleton. This portion is made out of bone, all this white, tougher, chalk-looking material. But then the portion that's here in the center, you'll see that it's a little bit clear. This is cartilage. And so this is not made out of bone. So the region we're talking about right now is where my hands are. It might be a little tough to see back there. But that's going to be below the cartilages. And that's what it's in reference to. And I'll show you right now. Say again. You say again, sir. Yes, they are. I'll show you right now. Pick this up. Oh my goodness. It's falling apart. And so, something that I want to sort of try to do. Is mm -mm -mm. oh come on mm -mm. and and so just so everybody can see if you look at this portion here this is going to be the bone and if you look closely here you can see that this is going to be cartilage so it's referring to the region right below the cartilages right below the cartilages and so that's all I wanted to show. Oh, that hassle. I'm almost breaking this model just for that. But I wanted it in the recording, so. All right, so with that in mind, if you look at this next segment, you'll see that if you know the left side, you know the right side. Nice and easy, right? Next portion, lumbar. This is the region where the lumbar is running, the vertebral portion of your vertebral column is running. In other words, this arch that you see here on your lumbar bones, that is going to be the region that we're technically on, but we are on the anterior or the ventral side of the body. But it's still 
in the front of that lumbar region. That's why it's called lumbar. You know one side, you know the other side. Lastly, inguinal was the key here. You can use, I think the word inguinal is best because, I know that's a new vocab word, so I'm gonna expect you all to exactly remember where it was, but inguinal was this little V region here that leads all the way down to the pubic region. Again, if we look at our annotated figure, it's this figure here, inguinal. And so you'll see that we're really talking about this region now, of that abdominal region. And that's why we see the word left inguinal or right inguinal. If you want to use the word iliac, you can. If you want to know why it's called iliac, to help you remember, it's because we have a hip bone called the iliac bone that's running through here. That if you were to actually just feel your hip and that part where you knock, you'll feel that hard part of your bone. That is what your ilium bone is. And so it's very close to that, and that's why it's called that. But otherwise, I would use inguinal because you need to know inguinal now because it's one of the words on that uh, region, one of the regions. And so, and then quadrant systems are very easy. Upper quadrant, lower quadrant, one on the left, one, one on the bottom left. So left upper quadrant, left lower, right upper, right lower. And if you're not sure during the exam, because it does happen on the exam, you know, you got so many things swirling in your head. If you were playing tic-tac-toe, which one would you use? Which image? The one on the right, right? The one on the right has the tic-tac-toe board. Do we see that in pink? And so that's a tic-tac-toe board. The quadrant system is math, X and Y axis. It happens sometimes that I just see them, students just mixing them up, and I get it. Just there's so much terms by the exam time that you might make a mistake. And I used to make students know where to find the organs within the abdominal range, but I'm not gonna do that this semester. And so this image is just here to show you overall where, how the organs situate around the digestive viscera. But otherwise, don't worry about knowing exactly where the organs sit. None of the other labs do that on this campus, so I'm not gonna do it to you here, just to maintain some sort of uh, fairness with the other labs. And so with that, Let's move on to our last segment, and that's going to be our directionalities and positions. Now, uh, starting with one that we already discussed is when we talked about the front of the body, and uh, actually, I lied. Let's uh, start here. This will be easier. Here. And I'm going to switch the order of this handout for next for next semester. And so when we look at this now, these are directions and terms that you must be able to use. You already know how to use two of them technically. Anterior and posterior. What is the, the front of the body is going to be called the anterior side, the front. What was the word we've been using this whole time? Ventral. Ventral. Ventral and anterior are the same exact word. Ventral and anterior are the same exact word. And therefore, posterior, the opposite side, posterior is going to be the back of the body. Think about how you're taking anatomy, and after you take anatomy, what class do you need? Physiology. So think to yourself, A and P, anatomy and physiology, A and P. And then for those of you starting off in anatomy or science class in general. So anatomy, physiology, or anterior, posterior. Ventral, dorsal. They're the same thing in human beings. Now, superficial and deep. When you're thinking about superficial and deep, you are thinking to yourself as if you can imagine our skeleton assistant here, and I don't want to drop him again, so let's bring him slower. Go, and let's go here to the side of flip it around. All right, and as you look at this portion, you can see that if you look at the surface here, you can see that here we have the surface Right, and if you have something sharp, this is gonna be, if I stop here, what is this gonna be? Superficial, and if I get something sharp, and I go this, what is this one gonna be? Deep. And so you can do this with the limbs as well, that if you're looking at it like this, and you're on the surface, right, there would be a bunch of muscle, like, so this bone is what? Superficial or deep when you're looking at the limb? Where is it if you compare it to the limb? Is it deep or superficial? The bones. Deep and the skin is superficial. Nice. Oh shoot! Let me just drop this thing again. All right. Mm -mm. All right. And so with that, 
If we go on to the next portion, we have medial and lateral. Remember that when we were using that first image, when we were using the longitudinal axis, this image, this is going to be key in learning medial and lateral. If you go towards this line, medial. If you go away from this line, lateral. And so if you examine that, those two words, you'll see that there's one more that fits in between. You have medial, lateral, and intermediate always will mean perfectly in between. Perfectly in between. There is a difference. For example, Like the, when you think about the nose itself, the nose sits perfectly right between two eyes. Medial means that I'm moving towards that medial line, but if I say that I'm talking about the nose, the nose would be intermediate. Now, how to use the two? Let's just compare only one eye, and I don't know why I'm using this when I have a presentation slide here. If we're looking at the eye and ear of our model here, our eye and our ear, and the ear is what to the eye? Lateral. The ear, sorry, the eye is what to the ear? What is it? Medial. And the, no, the eye is what to the nose? Lateral. The nose is what to the eye? The nose is what to the ear? The nose is what to both ears? Intermediate. Do we see how we use that now? All right. So usually intermediate refers being in between two things. You see how this sits in between? Or if we're looking at our nose, sits between these two things. But medial is a comparison or a direction. Intermediate implies sitting perfectly in between. We know parietal and visceral. You're only really going to see this on the walls. What's the cavity around the heart called? What's the word that means around the heart? Pericardial cavity. And what's the one around the lungs called? Pleural cavity. And those two cavities are inside of what cavity? Thoracic cavity. And what's the name of the wall closest to the organs? Visceral. And the wall furthest away? And what's inside of those two boundaries? Serous fluid, good, good. And now with that, as we move on, we have superficial and deep. Superficial, oh, sorry, we did those. Uh, sorry, I was thinking superior and inferior. So let's do superior and inferior first. This one's just as easily just going up the body and down the body, like so. Here you can see superior, sorry, let me get it in frame, superior and inferior. And so in comparison, when you travel down, it's inferior. When you travel up, it's superior. So that's pretty easy, right? Superior, inferior. The word proximal and distal are the same exact thing as superior and inferior. The only difference is that you only use on the limb. Only used on limbs. only used on limbs. And with that in mind, if we compare it now, this word proximal and distal, again, is, oh, is the same thing as superior. When you're traveling up the limb, proximal. Down the limb, distal. And so proximal is the same thing as superior. Now let's try some examples. And you don't have to flip pages. I'll do it for you here. You might have to go to your regions, but it might not for this one. Let's look at number two on, you have this on your handout, but you don't have to flip pages. We're just going to do this one example. And so we already know where the palmar region, where's that point to it on your body? Palmar. We know where our carpal region is. Point to that on your body. Now, right in the center line, 
I want you to write what are they relative to each other. The Palmer region is what to the carpal region, right? You're either going to use proximal or distal. Think about it quietly. And then you can write it in your handout if you want, or you'll get to it eventually. Or think about it quietly. And 10 more seconds. Get some Gatorade, and we are almost done. Hang in there. And so, what is our answer for this one? Distal. Distal. Very good. Our answer here is going to be distal. And one more time, what is the carpal in human speak? What is it? The wrist. And in human speak, what is the palmer? Palmer. Nice and easy, right? All right. And so let's keep it going. And then these two, feel free to cross off. Honestly, I have never used it in this class, and I never see any of you using it unless you take um, some sort of animal anatomy. And I'm going to go ahead and exclude it out. I've never used it, and I am just don't plan to. And then finally, our last slide, our last topic. And so, if we look at our model here, and the text above, let me see how large it is, pretty large. And so as you look at it here, you'll notice that if we start off on our sagittal line, a sagittal line, or a sagittal plane, pardon, Actually, let's talk about what we're learning. This is a visual tool. Like, you may not know this, but, you know, sometimes anatomy is just about being able to look at something and then being able to break it apart visually using these imaginary lines of dissection. Like, right now, if you were all imagine my head and I said, split my head in half like this, and then I want you to look at the inside of my, the, my skull right now. Like, you would just slice it. That would be kind of tough because you don't really know what's inside yet. But it'd be like me asking you to make a slice of this and then me showing you this. You see, so that's what this is about. It's about being able to see the body. And then if you slice a human like this, you'd be able to provide a viewpoint for everybody to study whatever it is you want to exhibit or show on anything, on the human body. And so you can do that for everything. You can do it for the skull. You can do it for the torso. You can just do it for the arm. And so you're just really imagining to yourself dis imaginary dissection lines. And those are referred to as planes. And so what easy one, the first one that you see on there is sagittal. Sagittal, we saw in the first picture, this is, a sa this is legitimately a sagittal plane. If you were to draw, if I told you, look at a person and make a sagittal viewpoint of them, you'd be making some sort of line that goes like this, and then you would split them open, and then again, you'd be able to sort of see this half, right? Because you can open up like this, and then you'd be able to see this. And so this serves as your sagittal plane. And even if we stay on that picture that you're on, you'll see it's called a sagittal plane, this one. This is called a sagittal. I know that it says something else. I'll show you in a second why. Sagittal. And so the word sagittal itself is a word Sorry, that's a sagittal. But it's a word that implies a line that cuts straight down. If, for example, you look at this, this is perfectly down the middle. But what if I drew a line that looks something like this? Like that. And see, this line, is the, that's a sagittal line as well. So you have to distinguish between a sagittal line here and a sagittal line straight down the center. If it's straight down the center, it's called a mid-sagittal line. If it's not in the middle, it's just simply called a sagittal line or perisagittal. So sagittal, you have two types. You have, oh shoot, sorry, wrong tool. You either have sagittal versus mid-sagittal. Mid-sagittal is perfectly down the middle. Sagittal is anywhere. You'll also hear sometimes it being called peri-sagittal. Because remember, peri means on the sides or around. And 
And so be aware of that. There's a model at the very back over there. Like he has like a yellow and gray tray on him and I might as well just show you. string and then create a unique label but otherwise this is the model I'm talking about tier planes and so you can see that that first sagittal line is that gray one that you see straight down the middle and then frontal is the yellow one you're seeing and that yellow one cuts and creates two directions it creates a front and a back but in anatomy we don't use front what's the one on this side of my head is called anterior and on this side of that yellow posterior and so that leads me to my final point about these planes. This is how the directions were created.